Welcome to the very first part of Power Magazine's brand new series, Power Insights. If you read Power Magazine, you'll know that we're committed to detailed coverage of all issues related to the global power industry. More than ever, it's important to put a face to the people and their ideas that drive this sector. I'm Sonal Patel, Senior Associate Editor at Power. And today I have the pleasure of speaking to Kurt Tirani, who is a Senior Staff Scientist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Kurt is also the Technical Director of the Transformational Challenge Reactor Program for the U.S. Office of Nuclear Energy at the Department of Energy. Thank you for joining me, Kurt. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, I think we are, uh, we just had, I had just had an interview with you on Friday and we talked a little bit about Oak Ridge is a really fascinating project. Um, it sounds like it was uh, kicked off only 15 months ago. Would you tell us a little bit about this project? Sure, at, at, at a nutshell, um, we, are, we are kind of looking back to our, our history and emulating kind of early days of formation. Uh, we uh, 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 used to be called Clinton Engineering Works. Uh, after Enrico Fermi uh, proved out you can have a neutron chain reaction uh, under a, a squash field near University of Chicago, they, they decided to build a continuously operating reactor. And they decided to do it in the, in the hills of East, Eastern Tennessee. So uh, uh, in February of 1943, they started construction. In November, they went critical. So in nine months, okay, human beings for the first time built a continuously operating reactor. So you fast forward and you know the history of it how it's a, it's, a, it's a source of energy in this country generates about 20% of our clean carbon free energy. Uh, so you fast forward, you, you take a look at it today, uh, you know, nuclear is expensive, it's slow, it's a, it's a bad financial bet, it's a big burden for your utilities. And, and, and you, whereas you, can, you look at a combined cycle of gas, you take a look at these other technologies, they've really, they've really come a long way, they're, they're Operating much higher efficiency, the capital costs are low, et cetera. So, so why is that? Uh, part of it, uh, I strongly believe, we believe, is that we are not uh, using <clears throat> uh, modern technologies. If you take a look at the, the light water reactor fleet, they're all based on 1950s, 60s uh, uh, designs and technologies, again, predating 1970. So, uh, the question is, you know, what can we do better today? Okay, first of all, can we do better today? Which obviously we can. Every, every other industry, even heavily regulated, they, they continue to innovate and adopt new technology as it comes in. So why, isn't, why should nuclear do that? And basically, in, 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 in a nutshell, our lab director you know, told me, hey, they built it in the 40s, the first one in nine months. How fast can you guys do it? How, how much better can, can you do it? And so really what we're trying to do, we're trying to go, we are a science laboratory. Right? So we, we take a look at advances in material sciences, computational sciences, manufacturing sciences, and we're saying, hey, what are some, some of these advancements that we can harness, bring to bear for nuclear technology? Okay? And so we really want to take those fundamentals, uh, 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 identify technologies at a technology readiness level of this is a TRL scale in the NASA lingo, a two or three, which is kind of in the concept phase, and bring them to fruition to a TRO of about six or seven, where, where they're demonstrated, they're available for industrial adoption. So again, going back to those, those, those fundamentals, really what we're looking for is a better, a faster way of doing nuclear. Because I don't think nuclear energy is a source of energy can, we can afford for it to go away. But we need to do it more economically, we need to do it faster, we need to do it better. <coughs> Most of these technologies that you are working with in the reactor demonstration, are generally uh, TRL two or three, and you are trying to push them to six or seven. Yeah. So, so, so it, it, it specifically, we're looking at we are we're trying to exploit uh, added manufacturing specifically across the board for everything we're doing. Uh, there are four specific te technology th thrusts that we're targeting. One of them is you know instead of these boring geometries, uh, simplified you know rod sphere plate. Uh, you take a look at a biological system, you look at you and I, you know, we don't have perfect, perfect you know, cylinders and 90 degree angles. We are very incredibly efficient uh, 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 and, and we have this complexity in, 
in, in, in the design of our body. And it's the same thing goes with, uh, with uh, uh, energy systems. How do we exploit the geometric freedom that's offered to us by additive manufacturing to harness more power, get better efficiency, improve safety, um, reduce loads on, 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 the comp on, these, on these critical components. So the first one is <coughs> exploiting advanced manufacturing with design. And the way you do that, you do it in, in an integrated fashion. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't do kind of design for six months and then go, go do manufacturing. You do it in an agile and iterative fashion. That's the first one that, that we want to demonstrate and show advanced designs, okay? Number two uh, thing that we want to do is materials. I'm a materials guy. Again, it really bothers me that we don't have post 1970s materials in our uh, current fleet of reactors. That that has to change. And so, so when we're doing advanced additive manufacturing, even if you're using a historic alloy, because of the way you're processing it, you're essentially making a new material. So it's an opportunity to introduce these these new materials into these reactors. Materials like really refractory radiation resistant high temperature ceramics that you know were mature and available back in, the, in, in those decades, 50s, 60s, right? So that's the, the second one, materials technology. The, the third one is we are not, we're not trying to additively manufacture sensors. There's, there, there's folks working on those areas too. But again, because we're doing additive manufacturing, because we're building layer by layer, we have the opportunity to embed things, just have distributed sensing. And sensors are not the sensors of yesterday either. Now we can have distributed sensing by optical fibers or ultrasonic sensors. So we want to integrate sensing into our critical components that we're added to be manufacturing. And by doing so, be able to get, be able to get continuous monitoring, health monitoring, and a lot more information from our systems that we're getting today. And this should be obvious to, to, to your readers. Having more data, we're, we're living in the age of big data. And how do you exploit that data to do digital twins, to, to do health monitoring, and most importantly, autonomy, autonomy, autonomy. Uh, again, we can't have 400 people running a plant where the gas plant takes seven people to run. So we need more data coming from these systems, more automation, more autonomous operation to, to make it more economic. The, the fourth one, and is really, again, so all three that I talked talk to you is exploiting AM. The fourth one is also exploiting added manufacturing. It's probably the most important thing that we're doing. We are no longer forging, casting, machining a block, okay? We, we're building something, and let me use the cup again, we're, we're building something small volume by small volume, right? So if I'm building this, you know, small volume by small volume, I can monitor it as a function of time, because I'm, you know, I'm going step by step, which means I, I also have information as a function of space distributed in this material, right? So I have all this information coming in. What are we collecting? We're collecting imaging information, infrared signatures, optical signatures, acoustic signatures, any kind of information that I can get from my machine, voltage, current, humidity, how many times did Kurt, you know, show up and kick the machine that day. So, <laughs> so all this information goes in there, right? right. And, and, and now we can use artificial intelligence, machine learning. We can, we can, these, these are, again, these are mature technologies that are being used elsewhere. We can use that to see, hey, do I see a correlation? between the performance of this very critical component that I'm making and information I'm collecting during manufacturing. This is huge to be able to establish that link for this critical application. Uh, and, and again, it's, it's huge because first of all, we're, we're now having a much more data rich approach to qualification certified component, but it's gonna save a lot of time and money if we can establish this. So this is a hypothesis at the moment, but if you can establish this, it's gonna save a lot of money. Why? Because right now, uh, you go ahead and, and buy a, a, a bolt, you put it in your bike, it's like a fraction of a, a, a dollar, and then you buy the same bolt that has a nuclear stamp, M stamp on it, and it's like, it can be $20,000. I know a utility that paid $20,000 for a bolt, okay? So why is that? It's that quality assurance and certification that goes into it. You have to make the part, you have to have all these procedures, then you have to do all this examination afterwards. This adds to a lot of cost. How do I do on the fly examination? Much more rich than I was doing before. And if I can do that and establish that, that's huge. And by the way, that's way bigger than, than nuclear energy. It goes for any, any critical component. So these are the four te technology thrusts that, that we are, we've defined. 
they are, as, as you can see, as I'm explaining it, they're, they, they started out more or less in the concept phase, TRL two or two or three. And really what we're trying to do, and by doing this demonstration, we're trying to show, hey, it's not just like a journal paper or like a little, 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 little uh, scientific study. It, we're bringing and we're showing that, hey, this is viable. It was tested, it was demonstrated. And when it gets into that TRL six or seven, why is that important? It's important because it facilitates industrial adoption. It, fa it facilitates, there's actual work there, there's actual demonstration there to invite the regulator in, you know, have them see it, have them live it. And again, I, I, I commend the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they're coming in and they're very open mind. They're sending their staff, they want to be involved in these processes and understand and learn it. And again, if, we, if you're successful in, in, in doing that, and this is what our role is as national labs, is to do these things at these lower TRLs, to get it to that level, and then when it's there, it can be adopted, and we, we can get it out of the way, and we can have a domestic nuclear sector that's using modern technology to build better systems. As far as you know, uh, Oak Ridge has been, uh, you know, a name in the history of nuclear power for many reasons and technology-wise. Um, this pro this project, uh, this program specifically, is uh, is it a novel undertaking for a for Oak Ridge, um, has it ever, have you, have, has Oak Ridge ever, you know, started from scratch, essentially, since, you know, 1943, when you were talking about the first um, reactor? Yeah, so, so you, you mentioned that it's, uh, this would be the, 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 the 14th reactor, uh, yeah. if, if it, when it goes critical in, in the Oak Ridge Reservation. Uh, the last one that went critical, I believe, was 65. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, so, so that there was two reactors went, went critical on that year. A molten salt reactor experiment, which is very popular because it was the, the real molten salt reactor, and then the high flux isotope reactor, which I'm a big fan of. I use a lot, and, and it's it's I'm proud to say it's still operating. It's operating today. Um, so, so, so we we haven't done this in a while. Now this now this is Oak Ridge, right? But let me tell you, we haven't done this in a while in this country. The last one that went critical in the United States was a, a fast flux te test facility in, 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 in Hanford Engineering Development Laboratory in Washington, in the state of Washington, and th that went critical in 79. Okay, so now we, we do a little bit of quick math. It's been four decades since, since we did this as a nation. Okay, right. uh, For Oak Ridge, this is very interesting. I, 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 had a, I, uh, I like to communicate about what, what we're doing. So I, 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 I set up a laboratory update internally, went to our biggest auditorium. And I thought, you know, some of the people from the program, some other people will show up. The room was packed with people, there was people standing. And, and you know, I, I realized, and, and I can see, we're really pulling in from every different uh, echelon of, of the laboratory, every, every different uh, uh, pocket directorate division of, of the laboratory. So there's, there's, there's these different people that know very different things, okay? And one of them is a material science person. The other one knows how to do nuclear calculations. The other one cares about neutron scattering. The other one cares about electronics. They're, they're very, very different skill sets, very specific skill sets, okay? But then this is one of those few projects that it really takes the whole, you know, breadth of knowledge and expertise at, at the lab. And, and I'm not, I'm not telling you, it's not easy getting all these, you know, like very experts working together, but if you do, magic happens. So it's very much, it's, it's interesting because again, this is how the place got started and it's resonating even today. A project like this is kind of brings everybody together. So there's, there's a lot of interest and excitement there. We haven't done it in a long time, but certainly we, we think we can and we're excited to do it. I think we're seeing the same sort of with the birth of, the, or at least this anticipation that we're about to see the uh, continuation of um, new nuclear with advanced reactors in the industry. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting in the same way that you know it brings together a lot of different people from all spectrums of the industry. Um, it takes, it, it takes a, a whole village. If, if you take a look at it, even the advanced reactor community, which we're, we're very, very engaging very closely with, it really it's really a national effort. It's it's not something that, that, that you can do in a, in a pocket. It, it really takes national will, and I think that's great. And, and, and you've got to remember. This is, this is how the current Blackwater Reactor Fleet came about. There was a man named Hyman Rickover, who maybe he wasn't liked by some people. He was, he, he was very goal oriented and he, he was sent to Oak Ridge in 1946. Uh, and and he, was, he went to power school and, and, and he wrote a letter 
to his superior officers in the Navy that, hey, I think we can do uh, naval propulsion with nuclear in four to seven years. He sent a letter in, in 1947. And, and, and they were like, ah, you know, we, we don't know if, if, if this, this is gonna work. And, and he proved them, you know, he, he was very tenacious, he proved them wrong. In 1954, a submarine Nautilus was launched with nuclear power. And that technology, which was water, water reactor technology, or, or, uh, the patent for the light water reactor belongs to our longest serving lab director, Alvin Weinberg. He made buddies with Rick Over, and he told him, yeah, we can make it work with water. And Rick Over wanted water, because he was, you know, wanted to go and see. So, so he demonstrated it in 1954, uh, 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 the submarine went in. After he launched the, the submarine, we built a land prototype in, in shipping for Pennsylvania. And that became the model for all the light water reactors, which uh, the 400 reactors all across the world that are, are, are generating electricity, right? My point to you is that it, it really, it came from a national will. It came from a, a, a lot of, of, uh, of the, the people, a lot of different organizations were involved, just like the Manhattan Project, right? And then, but, but once you demonstrate these technologies, it becomes these, these fantastic things that, again, the, uh, lots of folks, the industrial sector can, can run with. They did. They did. And, and the 20% the of electricity that we have today, clean, carbon-free electricity, is owing to that technology. We need to, again, uh, uh, go back and, and, as a nation, lead this. I, I want to see the next advanced reactor technology coming from us. There is no reason why we can't do it, but, but uh, have the will to, again, demo it again and hand it to our domestic sector. So today we've been getting a lot of interest in, in the piece that we wrote um, uh, stemming from our interview. Um, and one of the things that has, I think a lot of folks are interested in is the progress that you've made in 15 short months. And we talked a little bit about the, the sort of uh, new approach that you're, you're, you have for this project. Um, so what I wanted to ask you was you, you are, um, you are going to 3D print a uh, nuclear reactor core and you have now already, um, you have a prototype that you've already printed. And so what happens now? Yeah, so, so, uh, so basically we, uh, you touched on this and I want to explain this. We are, the reason we're, we're moving this fast is because we're adopting a process called the Agile design process. And it's, it's a process that's been used in, in software development circles since the 80s. Okay? Essentially, and you know, I, 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 I talk to our, our staff and they understand it, but you know, basically uh, some of these projects, the design people go in a room for six months and they just look at their computers and they come out and they say, hey, here's a design. And then we have to see, hey, can we make it? Okay? We don't like that. We, we don't do that. Um, instead, we, we set these short-term goals, just like the, these sprints under the Agile process. The design is fully integrated with manufacturing, right? Instead of somebody having to stare at a computer and think, hmm, I wonder if it's gonna work, come up with something, let's go make it, let's put it together, let's see if, if it all fits together, it makes sense. Let's, let's have the unknown unknown bubble up to the surface quick, okay, as opposed to haunting us down the road, and learn from it and iterate. The other thing is that it's not just like, hey, can, we, can I make this stuff? The other thing is that, you know, in, these are complex systems, there's multi-physics going on. There's neutrons flying around, there's heat being transferred by convection, radiation conduction, there's vibration, there's all stuff going on. Okay, build a little sub-assembly and flow something around it. Measure the properties you want, measure the thermal properties, me measure vibration, measure heat transfer, and then feed it directly back into your design. Reduce your uncertainties, add confidence to, to your various analysis, in, including specific safety analyses. So this allows us to move very, very fast. And uh, now, you know, you're going to have the discipline to, to down-select them and, 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 and move quickly, you know, as opposed to, hey, this is an interesting research. I want to carry it, even though, although, you know, so that's the hard part, to be honest. But, you know, you got, you got to have a discipline. But so maybe, basically, we, 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 we down select our technology. We have micro-encapsulated fuel form, these, these uh, triso fuel particles. We're using an advanced uranium nitride triso. We are, that, that's conventionally manufactured. We are 3D printing high purity crystalline nuclear grade silicon carbide, okay? And that silicon carbide becomes the host, the matrix where we, we host these small fuel particles. You, these fuel particles are about one millimeter in diameter. They look like black beads. And then we basically, we, we fill these complex silicon carbide shells with, 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 with this, this fuel form and consolidate it. 
So we've made a, 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 a number of these. We've, we've gotten properties from them. We've done flow testing. We've actually irradiated some, some, some small samples of them in our reactor, and we, 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 we will be doing more reactor testing to just make sure you know, all, the, all the latest and greatest data comes into it. We, uh, and right now, what we're doing, we're building a mock-up of the entire core, and the core is not that big. We can afford to do it. It's, it's, it's less than half a meter cube, so it's, you know, it's 0.8 meter diameter and this tall. Uh, maybe, maybe bigger than a keg of beer, maybe, maybe, maybe <laughs> think, think, think of a wine, you know, wine barrel. So it's, 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 it's that size. So we can do it. So, so there's no reason why not to. We have the, the, the additive machine. We mock it up, we continue to learn from this, okay? And, and, it, and then we, we do the design refinements. Our focus is, is the core because that's the hard part. That's the part where you need a nuclear facility out in a national laboratory to do. That's the hard, that's hard to do in a, in a, a, in a garage in, in San Francisco Bay Area. And by the way, I, I, I come from there, so I, you know, there's, there's a reason. There is reason we need, we need to do the stuff here. So we, we're trying to go out after the hard problem. Right now, the, 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 the stages we're in, we have, we have our conceptual design completed. We've got to take it to preliminary and final design. The design activities feed our regulatory process, which is a, which is a, a complex process. We are seeking a, a Department of Energy license. We're again, we're very much, we're getting very good support from our, our, our local and headquarters, the, the Department of Energy colleagues that are ultimately responsible for, for, for regulating us. Uh, we need to go ahead and, and build a simple loop. We are, we are, we, we basically, we want to show the core is the fancy part again, and it's the high value part. So we're additive manufacturing the core. We, we're going to place it inside a simple loop where we have a pressurized helium gas, inert gas that, that, that goes around and cools this core. And we, we, we reject that heat to the environment. The test will demonstrate the core. So we need to go ahead and build that loop, which is again, not that uh, burdensome. And right now, the, the, again, the part that's interesting is taking that uh, uranium, the high assay, low enriched uranium, which is 19.75% enriched uranium. That, again, that, that comes from our, our friends in the Y12 uh, uh, facility, again, in, uh, right, right next to the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So we, 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 need, we need to take that uranium, process it in, into these uh, uh, trace of fuel particles, compact it into our fuel assemblies. Uh, we are using uh, a, an advanced moderator. It's, uh, it's a, it's a uh, moderators, their role is to slow down neutrons and we need those to achieve a small core. Hydrogen is the best because it has, it's basically a proton, it has the same mass as a neutron. So when the neutron collides with it, it loses most of its energy. It's very good for slowing down neutrons. That's why water is so great. But we are using the highest temperature compound that we, we know of uh, that's, uh, that contains hydrogen, okay? That's, that's a solid. And that is yttrium hydride. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a metal hydride. It's a big, beautiful blue metal when you process it. So we, we need about 400 kilograms of yttrium hydride. Again, this is a great example. They knew these hydrides are great in the 60s, okay? They, the United States launched a reactor into space that used these hydrides and they used zirconium hydride then. Why didn't they use yttrium hydride? Because yttrium wasn't available as an industrial metal at the purity you need. It's available today. So we developed a process for it. We were using this moderator. Essentially, we're right now, we're done with this technical down selection and things like that. We know what we're making. We're simply going through the process of scaling things up building the, the, the things that they, 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 we need to build, put them together, and make sure we, we have our, uh, our final design and, and our uh, uh, document of safety analysis approved so we can turn the switch on. I can't wait to see what you guys do with this. I am excited to see it. Um, I think, um, frankly, there's, it sounds like there's a lot of work, and then you are looking at 2023. Um, mm -hmm. That's right. We're, we're looking to move as fast as we can. The essence of this program is to is to show we can do it fast. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's a different way. Right. Uh, well, I think we're just going to have to keep watching. I hope you will come back and talk to us again. Absolutely. You know, the more progress you make, I think we just want to to keep uh, following and and wish you luck. And thank you so much for talking to you. Me. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.